Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? If you can, please give me a thumbs up in the chat. We'll just wait for maybe another minute. Thank you. Uh, we'll wait for another minute for more people to join and we'll get started. Um, so in the meantime, a very good evening or good day to uh, the people who've already joined. I hope everyone's safe, uh, well, and so are your loved ones. Uh, I'm Susanna. Uh, I work with uh, Editage uh, here at Cactus Communications, and uh, we are primarily work with authors from across the globe uh, to help them with their manuscripts uh, in various forms in terms of language, in terms of, uh, you know, structure, formatting, style, and various other services. Uh, so today I will be taking you through uh, a live edit uh, on a, more of a biomedical, uh, you know, a nanobiotech uh, biomedical materials uh, paper. Uh, at any time, you can feel free to use the chat to ask me your questions. Uh, I will take questions only towards the end, uh, so I won't pause, but as and when questions come up, uh, feel free to populate the chat. Um, and yes, uh, I think, you know, in the interest of time, I think we'll get started. Uh, so great, I will share screens. Uh, and if there's any trouble, uh, Neha, uh, please let me know if uh, my screens are not visible. All right. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Just gonna switch back. Yes, I think so it is. Yes. All right, great. So uh, before we get started with the actual manuscript, uh, I'd like to just take you through some of uh, the things that I've learned over these uh, many years as an editor. Uh, one of the things that I've realized, uh, which a lot of us as editors discount, is the importance of having a good checklist, uh, giving yourself a sense of direction. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we feel like as editors, oh, we know everything, or, you know, uh, we we know our field, we know our matter, we know the various style guides, and, you know, we'll just go with the flow. We'll know when we see a sentence, we'll know what to do with it. Uh, that's not always the case. We are human. Uh, so it's oftentimes that, you know, despite our best intentions, we do end up forgetting to do certain things. Um, or at times it doesn't strike you, which is why I always feel like it's very important to have a good checklist and have a good vision of what you want to do with that manuscript. Uh, so the next few slides will talk about a very general and a fundamental uh, checklist. It's not exhaustive, but it's something that you can build on. Uh, the checklist is also in the slides are important is because as we go through the live edit, I will touch upon some of the categories listed in the checklist so that, you know, it's easier for you to uh, understand uh, what are some of the changes, why we've made a few of those changes. All right. Okay. Great. Uh, so uh, the first thing is um, just a quick uh, the, the, uh, view of uh, where we are based. Uh, the various brands under, you know, uh, associated with Editage. Uh, and yeah, uh, coming to the checklist. So the first thing is about crafting the research story. Uh, this is not so much of a checklist as it is, you know, five main points or five rules that I feel that every manuscript should have. The first thing is it should be meaty. Uh, meaty in the sense it should have some valid content, a valid research question. It can't be something that's very abstract uh, or very, uh, you know, diffuse, etc. And it's very roundabout, you know where it's not very clear what you're studying or or what is being done. So it definitely has to have meat into it in terms of a definite research question, a definite aim, as well as some robust uh, 
methods as well as statistical analysis. And where it also needs to be very, very meaty is your discussions, because that's where, you know, you're talking about the interpretation of your uh, study. Uh, oftentimes, we find that authors tend to focus a lot on the introduction, which is, you know, your literature, uh, research, etc. and stuff like that. But it's not so much to do with setting up the story as it is about where you take that story. Your results, your discussion is where the story is, you know, finally going to end. And that's what's going to stay with the reader. So if those sections aren't meaty, if they aren't clear, uh, then that's going to be a problem. When I talk about clear or clarity, uh, what I mean is not just in terms of, of uh, language, but also in terms of thought. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see this in introductions where um, there are all these various concepts uh, that the author uh, feels that leads, leads up to their aim or their study. So as we know, uh, a manuscript uh, follows the, Im generally most manuscripts follow the IMRAD structure, uh, provided it's a research article, an original research article, reviews, letters, etc., case reports, they follow a different format. Uh, but in for original research articles, it follows that MRAD format. Um, oftentimes, people will talk about it being a funnel, uh, where your I in your MRAD is your introduction, and it's the start of maybe the glass, uh, where you talk about what is currently known, uh, what is not known, uh, and uh, what is the exact gap that you're trying to plug in. So there's a lot of things that could be unknown, but what is the specific gap that you're trying to plug in? And what are you going to do about it in very brief? All right, so it narrows down from something that was this big, it narrows down to finally your aim. Uh, what we often see with introductions is where, uh, you know, there are several of these paragraphs to talking about these points, but they're not linked with one another. So at the end, when you're reading the aim, you're like, okay, I know about, you know, diabetes affecting people. I know that this is the current mode of treatment, but I don't understand why you're proposing another form of treatment if, you know, I don't know what, how they are linked, etc. and things like that. So, so clarity also refers to link. Uh, the other part of the uh, R class, uh, so the R class goes from this to this, uh, where you started the discussion, where the discussion talks about, you know, the research question uh, and what they've done, and then goes to talk about the main findings, how it's related to what the study is, etc., and things like that. So, so it broadens, it puts the findings of this research article into context. Oftentimes, that doesn't happen is because uh, it tends to be a repetition of the introduction. In fact, in the paper we're going to discuss, uh, despite it being a published paper, I was a little surprised that, uh, you know, with the results in the discussion section, because to me, it read more like a result section. There was very little discussion about interpretation and, you know, putting it into context. Uh, so again, I felt that the paper wasn't very clear. Precise and efficient as well as the next point, necessary. Uh, oftentimes we feel like, you know, we need to use flowery language, you know, very fancy terms to get our point across. Uh, oftentimes we feel that, you know, we have to use passive voice uh, because passive voice sounds a lot more imposing, a lot more royal. Uh, but the sentences of, with any time when you write passive voice, the sentences automatically become much longer. Uh, we do see also sometimes, um, people are a little scared to use pronouns to say we did this or uh, we conducted the following experiment, etc. Uh, because they feel like, okay, you know what? No, this is not accepted. Yes, maybe 10 years ago, it wasn't accepted. Uh, it was frowned, about, frowned upon, sorry. Uh, but now that has changed considerably. We no longer have to be restricted to using passive voice to well. We no longer have to worry about, you know, uh, using personal pronouns in an article we can. In fact, oftentimes journals encourage it because then the words you use, uh, they're more effective, they are necessary, and you're not stretching out sentences uh, completely. Uh, there is also that concern that, you know, uh, if we say we did this, um, you know, or we use the verb rather than the, you know, the noun form of uh, something, uh, it, it, it sounds a little too abrupt, uh, you know. So, um, like we say, uh, 
oftentimes you'll say we perform blah blah uh, we perf this aspect let's say this uh, you know the cell proliferation uh, we perform the cell proliferation analysis you use that we could just simply say we analyze cell proliferation it just becomes shorter uh, but i think a lot of authors still uh, stop themselves from doing it because they feel it becomes com too compact but in fact that's more that's encouraged so long as there is a flow it's clear uh, and the last thing is effective so again in this paper we're going to be talking about where you know uh sometimes you have all the information in a sentence but how are the words arranged in a sentence is your main point at the start or is it somewhere at the end of the sentence or in the middle lost in like a lot of jargon and a lot of terminology uh where do you want the emphasis to be what is the main point and that's what i talk about effective uh also what are your concluding statements in each section if you just leave it you know as broad as you know you started off the reader doesn't have much to go on like from one section to the other uh from say if your aim is not clear in your introduction it's a little hard for the reader to then understand okay why you're doing all the experiments that you have listed in your methods materials and methods what are the why are these results important so that's what i talk about effective now coming to your pre-editing very basic checklist obviously check for plagiarism uh, sometimes it happens unintentionally uh and oftentimes you feel that you know oh we've already published so we can just lift things off from our own previous publications. Note that self-plagiarism is also a, a publication ethics issue. It's not accepted. So please make sure that if you are unsure whether you know some of these words, you know, sometimes you have this earworm when you listen to music and the lyrics just keep playing in your head. Uh, and automatically, sometimes it comes out in conversation and things like that sort of without you realizing it. Uh, so we always do encourage everyone to do a set of plagiarism checks just so that you know you are 100% sure uh, that you've not unintentionally lifted uh, things from other manuscripts verbatim. Spell check settings, very, very important uh and i will uh, show you the spell check settings when i start uh doing the editing now you might think what exactly are these settings so i'll show you when we start so it'll make a lot more con uh uh make a lot more sense obviously understanding what is the aim and the scope of your target journal or the target journal so if you're editing a manuscript for somebody else obviously understand where where they're going to submit uh, the reason being is because you obviously need to understand what are the requirements uh who is the readership uh you know who is this manuscript meant for uh and uh you know does this manuscript actually fit into the scope of the journal because oftentimes we'll have a manuscripts on say traditional medicine you know uh and there are some international publications even in uh, the biomedical uh, sphere that do not accept papers that focus on regional traditional medicine uh, because they feel it might not necessarily have, you know, the international reach or whatever. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that, you know, whether it's your own paper, whether it's someone else's paper, it's going to the right home. Uh, it's fitting the scope. Obviously, uh, also check the formatting style, the formatting requirements. Uh, there is a lot of debate about whether, you know, we should scrap uh, formatting requirements altogether and we should just be okay with whatever uh, style that the author submits. But a lot of uh, journal editors do use this as a form of uh, understanding how serious you are in terms of um, submitting it to and getting it published in their journal. So sometimes the formatting is a little off, it would be a straight off desk rejection. There are journals, of course, so you would see under the Elsevier umbrella, they do have this, uh, which is your paper, your way. So when journals say that, you know, you can just submit it in any style, no obligation to uh, stick to a specific format, then it's perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about formatting. But for other journals that don't do that, uh, formatting is very important, especially template application. You want to add the template at the very start as opposed to at the very end, because once you start making changes and then, you know, you apply the template, your figures can get displaced or lots of uh, text can get corrupted, etc. So you want to do that at the start. 
And yes, if there are any style guides that you need to refer to, uh, especially if the journal recommends it, sometimes they will tell you, you know, uh, format uh, the references as per, you know, APA, American uh, Psychological Association, the manual. Or say, for example, the AMA, uh, you know, sometimes uh, they will say uh, you can use abbreviations without definition so long as they are part of the uh, AMA. Uh, so just make sure, read the journal guidelines to see if any style guides required. Coming to on the job, once you've started editing, what are the things that you need to look for? Obviously, grammar and sentence structure. Under that, you will be looking at tense usage or voice, whether it's active or passive, article usage, er, uh, and the. It, can, it sometimes gets a little complicated. So you would say... Um, you know, we have this rule, I think all of us learned when in school that, you know, if there's a vowel, uh, then you use an. If it's not, you use a. If it's very specific, then you use the. Like, you know, you can, what it means is a cat sat on the mat. It's just a general cat. That's I don't know. Uh, the cat sat on the mat means that you're referring to someone's specific cat. Uh, probably you shared context in a previous sentence, you know, uh, Mark has a a cat named Pablo and the cat then sat on the mat, whatever. So, you know, you're talking about Pablo, the cat. Uh, so just a few things of that sort. But as you start editing, you realize that there are a few more nuances. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Singular plural usage subject verb agreement. Uh, oftentimes we make this error. We say the data is present in appendix, blah, blah, blah. Data is plural. Data is not singular, so you can't use the verb is. It is data are. It sounds weird because we've sort of been conditioned to use is, but the singular form of data is datum. Uh, so smaller things like these tend to trip us up. Uh, punctuation, obviously, periods, hyphens, and dash. And in this paper, there were a few errors, errors with hyphenation. Logic. Sometimes the sentences grammatically sound beautiful, just doesn't make sense. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you one of those sentences in a bit. Parallelism is a lot of like consistency. So if you have a list uh, where you have like say um, science, mathematics, uh, engineering, physics, doctor. Something uh, is weird because doctor is a profession. The others are fields of study or research, whatever. So that's exactly what we mean by parallelism. They all have to be of the same format, the same category, etc. Modifiers. So modifiers refers to, you know, is the adjective actually correct, uh, mod describing the right noun? Or sometimes we have this tendency of separating the adjective and the noun. And then, you know, you're not quite sure uh, what that is uh, referring to. Comparisons. Uh, sometimes we tend to compare apples to oranges. Oftentimes you'll see this in your uh, discussion section or result section where you say, you know, uh, the results of this study are similar to previous studies. It might not strike you uh, at first, but you're comparing results of this study to previous studies, not the results of previous studies. And that's a comparison issue, a subtle one, but a very important one. Transition markers are obviously how you use uh, words like uh, on the other hand, uh, however, uh, in addition to, etc. Sometimes we tend to make a little bit of a mess with that. Uh, wordiness, obviously, your words have to be short, effective, and necessary. Word choice and conventions. So uh, collocations. Uh, collocations are, you know, uh, and this is a very uh, helpful website. You can use Oxford Collocations Dictionary. It's a free one online. Uh, sometimes you have a word and you don't know which verb to use. Do you say, um, you know, a study was conducted, a study was performed? Uh, do you see results uh, showed this or suggested and things of that sort? So you can look up collocations, the collocations dictionary, Oxford collocations, and it tends to give you suggestions that would make sense. So the verbs that you can use, the nouns you can use with that specific word. Confused words, um, oftentimes we see this with affect and effect. Uh, so um, affect is, you know, to have 
uh, the effect. Effect is the actual consequence. Or say, for example, regime or regimen. Regimen is like a course, you know, a medical a medication course or course a dietary course. Whereas regime is, you know, like government, uh, uh, you know, uh, or legislation in a particular country. Uh, so things are not so spelling obviously uh things to check abbreviations um do you need to spell them out uh when do you need to spell them out do you need to spell out dna or not so things of that sort. contractions contractions are a no-no you under no circumstance do you use terms like won't can't uh didn't instead of did not or cannot or will not uh you don't use that in um academic writing Capitalization. This is a very important point, and I will bring this up during the article. Numbers and units. Do you spell them out? Do you, uh, is it okay to just keep them in the numeral format? Uh, what do you do? Uh, so that's. And uh, before we go into final checks, the big picture. All these, the previous two slides talked about the minute sentence uh, aspects. But the big picture is what is your manuscript trying to say? What is the main message? Does every section in the manuscript have a key point? Do I get a takeaway from that? Uh, do my do, does each paragraph in each section do they flow logically? Are they interlinked? And do can I know what the paragraph is about just by reading the first sentence? You know, does it have a topic, or do I have to dig to finally figure out okay what is this paragraph talking about? Because no reader wants to you know uh, sit and dig through that. Um, also, are you sort of talking so much about the data that you have and the results that you forget to talk about what you are exactly trying to achieve uh, with this study? And you'll see that in this particular paper, I felt that this particular paper was we actually, you know, lost the plot somewhere in because everything was well. And then in the results, I don't really know ultimately what is the final conclusion. Uh, what is it that you want to show? How does it fit in the current context of the current system of uh, what we've already seen that's published, etc. Repetition and abstraction. That's basically having very broad, general view of things. The way you write is just like, yes, this could, uh, our results find that blah, blah, blah could impact, uh, uh, A could impact B. Impact what? Positively, negatively, in what way? What is this impact? Is it increasing some aspect? Is it decreasing some aspect? So that's what I mean by abstraction. And repetition is also if you keep repeating the same thing again and again. Uh, and finally, after you've done all your edits, always just proofread, run consistency checks, and double check journal requirements. All right? So we'll start with the manuscript. Uh, so I will. Can you tell me if this is visible? If not, you can go to the full screen view. Uh, I'm just gonna check. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, uh, great. So what I've done is uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of changes and some of you might be like, oh my God, uh, this is a published article and there are so many track changes. So yes, some of them are uh, more preferential. It's just that, you know, it's a um, better way of writing a few things. Uh, so yes, but the main points, I've highlighted them in yellow. And uh, that's what we're going to be discussing. Uh, so we'll be sharing, I believe we'll be sharing this manuscript later. So you can always go through this uh, at a later time and also understand some of the changes and feel free to send in questions. Um, but today what we will do is, what you need to focus on is uh, the changes that I've highlighted with yellow. Uh, and I will also make sure that the comment is visible. So in case you may prefer reading rather than listening to me, uh, you have that information there. So we'll start at the very beginning. Uh, now, when I edit uh, a manuscript, uh, I generally don't start with the title and the abstract. What I do start with is I go introduction, discussion, results, uh, methods, uh, methods and results. Uh, and then finally, I come to the abstract and the title is because with that uh, system, I have a fair idea of what they are talking about in their paper. Because sometimes when you start editing an abstract, especially somebody else's manuscript, 
I struggle sometimes because I'm like, I don't have the full context. So I always start with the main manuscript uh, and I combine introduction and discussion because they are actually two parts of the same R gloss. Uh, so yes, uh, that's how I start. But for, for this purpose, we're just going to start with at the very beginning. Uh, so yes, you'll see uh, what I've done is I've used track changes. So if there's a strike through, that means this is a deletion. If there's an underline, that means I've added something. All right. So I will first show you what it looked like. What was the original comment, uh, title? So you'll see this is a rather long title. There's a cure. So there is this a blah, 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 hydrogel is effective at inhibiting the proliferation of uh, blah mutant lung cancer cells. All right. Now we'll look at what the change was. What you'll notice is I removed the first article. I removed unnecessary words of is effective at inhibiting. So this is what I was talking about as nominalization, you know, rather than just saying it inhibits, we went is effective at inhibiting. So we sort of may use the noun form rather than the verb form. Uh, be mindful that, you know, uh, you can't always switch it to the verb form, but because I've read the paper and I have sufficient context, I felt like it's enough to just say that it inhibits rather than saying is effective at inhibiting. Another thing that you'll notice that I made the change was I added this hyphen. Uh, I also added this hyphen, all right? Uh, and I'll explain the hyphenation in a bit, but just in terms of uh, the changes I've made. So now, why did I make some of these changes? So I'm just going to scroll a little bit so you can see the comment. So the first thing is, this is not meant, your title is not meant to be a full sentence. So where, you know, like I say, a cat sat on the map, that's that's not a title. Uh, unless you're reading a book by Dr. Seuss, but uh, in original articles, that's not the case. So you can remove unnecessary articles because uh, it's not required. Uh, the second point is that, um, you know, the effective at inhibiting, like I said, I've read the paper, I think it's enough to say that it inhibits uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it, you, why use three words when you can use one? Oh, actually, that's four words. Yeah, you why use four words when you can use one? Uh, so it just makes the title more impactful and a lot clearer what you're trying to say. Because effective at inhibiting is like, you know, sort of hedging your bets in the sense like, you know, yeah, it is effective, but you're not being firm about it, that sort of thing. Now, very important to remember, not all journals are okay with declarative titles. Declarative titles are basically when you tell the reader that this is what our paper or what our study found. Uh, so you will have to check uh, your journal guidelines as to what is expected. And that's why I've included formatting, checking as a pre-editing check. It's very important to know whether, say, for example, in this particular Journal of Applied Biomaterials, etc., uh, do they allow for declarative titles or not? So it's always important to check. Uh, some journals uh, will suggest how it should be written so you can follow that step. Now, in this case, it was fine. So I've retained a uh, declarative title. Coming to the hyphenation usage. All right. So the original said a dopamine modified pH sensitive hydrogel. Now, all of these words, dopamine modified pH sensitive, they are defining hydrogel. All right. Uh, they are all descriptors. So similarly here, uh, if you have just crass mutant lung cancer cells, uh, it would just be like, okay, it's just some random mutant uh, cells. But it's actually, this is defining these. Uh, so it's basically very specific lung cancer cells. It's defining lung cancer cells. Hence, the uh, hyphenation is required. A better example would be here, uh, this one, uh, pH sensitive hydrogel. You know, the original is just, you know, a just bunch of a string of nouns. But the thing is, together, both the words, both the nouns here are defining hydrogel. So this becomes a compound adjective. And when you have compound adjectives, you typically use the hyphen. Uh, there are some exceptions, of course, but in most cases, when you have several words defining a single noun, 
uh, they're not se so sensitive is not standing alone. It's actually defining hydrogel pH and it's pH sensitive. It's not just sensitive or it's not just pH hydrogel. They both together are defining hydrogel. So which is why you need to use the hyphen just to make sure that together they define hydrogel. So that's one very important uh, thing to remember. Hyphenation is something a little tricky to get used to. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's a lot of learning to do. So I would say, you know, when you start editing, if you're early in your editing career, understanding comma usage, like your CV's comma, or what we call as Oxford comma, uh, it's required in American English, not required in British English, but required in Oxford English uh so it's very important because you know otherwise you're going to be making errors um for those of you who don't know a series comma or an oxford comma is if you have a list uh there should be a comma before the last item in the list uh we also do have other issues with comma usage like say comma splices where you combine two independent clauses uh, like two independent parts of a sentence and instead of using a conjunction like and or but you just connect them by using a comma oftentimes the sentence then stops making sense um so which is why i would say as a new editor my advice would always be go take on some learning material go through you know understanding comma usage and uh this uh hyphenation the others like using n dash n dash uh so n dash is generally uh n dash is generally used for e n uh, n dash is used for number ranges, etc. M dash has the same um, impact as a comma, but when you want to have like something very separate from the rest of the sentence. So, um, and I'll show you one example of uh, where you could possibly use uh, an M dash. All right, now coming to the uh, abstract. So I'll switch this one. Uh, now, see here, I have added a few words here. Uh, why? Uh, see, I will show you what the original sentence where it does. Okay. Um, so, hydrogels can do blah and may be useful to local targeting diseased areas. This doesn't make much sense. So, is it useful to the areas? Because it's that's how it reads, local targeting diseased areas. But what it means is it's actually useful to achieve localized targeting. It's not useful to the areas, which is how this reads, but it's actually useful for to enable localized targeting, which is why I've added that, to achieve localized targeting to diseased areas uh so this is very important because perhaps so not this is not the best example to say that the sentence is grammatically sound uh, uh because of the lack of preposition but uh there are some sentences that you know would be fine grammatically but they make no sense you know like maybe useful to an area how how are hydrogels useful to an area it's useful to allow this so always question you know what is what is the subject what is exactly the subject doing you know and always ask yourself so this is a very important case in understanding logic we've discussed punctuation and coming to this one so you'll notice that in the original uh the drug has a capital t whereas when i changed it i used lowercase t this is because this is not a brand name. Uh, Tasquini Mod is not a brand, but it's the generic name of the drug. So when you use generic names, you can use the lowercase letter. When you're using, uh, you know, uh, the brand name, that's when you need to uh, use the uh, capsule letter. So say, for example, if you were to use, like, say, an astringent, or you know um, a cleanser or whatever you just use the lowercase but if you use the word say Dettol or you know other brands like Savlon uh, or you know uh, Cetaphil or CeraVe those all would have to have the first letter capital because those are brand names this also applies to monoclonal antibodies so you have the generic name as well as you know the brand name for the 
uh, you know, monoclonal antibody. Same thing applies if it's just a generic name. And you can Google this. You'll know if it's a generic name or the brand name. Uh, generally, brand names will have, you know, the little trademark symbol or the registered symbol, etc. on Google. So, you know, if that is that's the case, it has to be capitalized. If not, lowercase. And you'll see that I've done it in other instances as well. Uh, so, yes, that was something to do with capitalization. For uh, so this paper, because this is a biomaterials paper, it doesn't have uh, binomial names. But uh, capitalization is also very important when you're dealing with bi uh, binomial names of certain organisms, plants, etc. Uh, obviously, your genus name. So, say for example, actinomycetes. Uh, when or say lactobacillus. Uh, so lactobacillus, if you're using it as the name of the genera, obviously it has to be, and there's a species after it, it has to be capital lactobacillus or whatever species are uh, followed after that. But if you're just referring to the general, you know, lactobacillus, like the lactobacilli present in probiotics, etc., then in that case, you're just referring to the entire group. You're not referring to a specific species. So you're not using the binomial name. So in that case, your lactobacillus will actually have to be just, uh, you would typically you'd refer to it as lactobacilli uh, because you're referring to many and not just one. In that case, you'd be using the lowercase uh, l. All right. So that's something that's very important to keep in mind. Also, uh, again, not in this paper, uh, but there are some exceptions like, say, uh, Western blot, Northern blot, Southern blot. Now, Southern blot was uh, something uh, that Edward Southern uh, invented, you know, that uh, that assay was something that Southern Edward Southern uh, invented. So, which is why? Because it's derived from his surname, Southern blot has a capital S. But Western and Northern are not derived from anybody's name. They are simply derived uh, because that was called Southern. So all these other assays will use similar a similar direction. So we uh, named some of them Western, or we named one Western and the other Northern. So you would always capitalize Southern blot, whether it's at the start of the sentence or not. But you would never capitalize uh, Western blot or Northern blot if it's in the middle of the sentence. Similarly, uh, if you work in microbiology, gram staining. Uh, this was named after the scientist who uh, started the method or the procedure of gram staining. So the G in gram staining will always be capital wherever it is in the sentence. But gram negative bacteria or gram positive bacteria will be lowercase if it's in the middle of the sentence. If it's at the start of the sentence, basic rules of grammar apply. But if it's in the middle of the sentence, you gram negative and gram positive, you don't capitalize it. Because gram negative and gram positive were not named after the scientist, but they are sort of derived from gram staining. Uh, so which is why, because they are named after the scientist, it goes with the lowercase. Similarly with Petri dish, and yeah, so a few exceptions. Uh, so you might want to just maybe always double check this uh, on, uh, you know, Google. Uh, you do also have a very good book, uh, which is uh, by Mimi Zyper, The Essentials of Biomedical Writing. Um, I can share the link if anyone wants it. Uh, this book is very, very uh, helpful to just understand how to go about editing a biomedical manuscript. What are the conventions? Your CSC manual is also extremely good for conventions. They keep updating it every few years, uh, but the basics, the fundamentals are pretty much the same across all versions. All right. All right. Uh, coming to the next point which is clarity and article usage. So this is what I was talking about uh, when I was saying, you know, uh, the impact, you know, are you putting the right word at the start of the sentence? Is it effective? If or say, for example, if it's at the end, so we'll two seconds, we'll look at the original. Okay, a recent study suggests that a third of patients with most prominent subtype of lung adenocarcinoma carrier this. Now, we are seeing this is the most prominent uh, subtype uh, or whatever. And, you know, so you would think that this has a lot of importance. This is, you know, like as a side or a matter of fact that, you know, okay, uh, most of the patients have this disease, which is the most prominent uh, subtype, as opposed to, you know, putting this and giving it primary place here. 
So what they did was I switched it over. A recent study suggests that one third, patient, one third of patients with lung adenocarcinoma as the most important prominent subtype of lung cancer carry a cross mutation. All right. Uh, this is because this is the most important thing. The patients have this disease. And as an aside, as a matter of like, you know, secondary fact, this is also the most important subtype of lung cancer. And they carry this cross mutation. So you generally want the most important details at the start of the sentence and at the end of the sentence. Things that are not necessarily essential come in the middle. If you put your essential information in the middle of the sentence, you're losing uh, the plot. Uh, now, uh, remember earlier I said you can use N, uh, N dash, sorry, not N, M, E, M, M dash, uh, you know, to as a replacement for comma. And this is exactly where you can use it. So these commas, if you notice this one and this one, set off secondary information, all right? Uh, this is not exactly essential this is sort of yes it's good to know and uh, it's secondary information you can also replace this with an m dash so you will have that in your symbols and i'll show you more symbols special characters so m dash is what i'm talking about m dash is used for uh, ranges number ranges etc uh so yes you can also set off non-essential information using m dash uh, coming to the next point, uh, which is article usage. All right. Uh, now, uh, here as well, you'll see uh, in the original, it didn't have the article though. Uh, but I've added it here as well as I've removed it here. Uh, why? Uh, so the reason being, uh, when you say something, you don't say... Uh, Carla is a best student in class. You know, you're using superlative form of the comparison. Like, this, it's unique. It's very specific. Carla is the best student in the class. They can't be two best. Because then, in fact, then they're just, they are unique. So, it's a, for example, sometimes we say, uh, you know, like it, it, this, it's you are either the best or you're not. So, in this case also, you're either the most prominent or you're not uh you can't have multiple so it's very specific so which is why you use the specific uh or the definite article though all right or if say for example if the word most wasn't there and you know you it's just one of the many prominent subtypes uh then you would say is a prominent subtype you know because there could be other options as well uh but because it's the specific and it's the most and it can only be unique which is why we use the Similarly, the same thing. There are several shortcomings. There is no one specific or few specific shortcomings that are very, very, you know, out there. That's the most important. You're just generically saying or in general saying that there are several shortcomings. So this is not required. All right. Uh, and yes, so we move on to the next page. So uh, sorry, because I'm looking at it in all markup view. So it looks weird. But if we were just to look without the changes, the mask looks fine. Right. Uh, but yeah, the gap that changes that I need here. Uh, again, oh, sorry, I can't see my comment. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, this was exactly the same thing where you want to emphasize uh, on uh, the most important thing at the start. Because otherwise, if you read the original, it's just like, you know, the addition of the material is increased due to the debris. I was like, oh my God, too many information. And I was like, I've lost, I've forgotten what you said at the first part. Uh, so, and also very, very important. This is at the end of your introduction section. Uh, when I read the paper, I was a little confused because I was like, are you sharing your results? Sorry, uh, are you sharing your results with me? If so, you shouldn't be sharing results in the introduction. You should be uh, proposing your hypothesis or what you expect your study to show or to prove, etc. Uh, but by saying the addition of increases due to the addition of dopamine is pretty much saying, here, take the cake and eat it too. Without Why do you need to then read the rest of the paper? So you never give away your results in the introduction. You can say, okay, my hypothesis is this and we expect uh, 
uh, that uh, this will likely be the result or whatever. Hence, I've changed this here. And I've also sort of moved this just for the impact because your hydrogel is talking uh, is about, you know, uh, delivery of dopamine. So it's not uh, that, uh, you know, this is the main subject. So which is why I moved it here. Right. Uh, coming to the next section. All right, so this is now one of the final parts of the introduction. What you will see here is uh, something that's not very common, but uh, when we cite people, when we cite uh, publications and we want to use, refer to the author or the researcher, only refer to the first one. You don't have to refer to everybody in the reference list unless it's, say, for example, a journal requirement. Also, never use etc. Etc. is for things. Et al. is for people. So always make sure that you use the first author and then et al. And you don't have to list everybody. All right. Uh, coming to the next point. We'll have a certain impact. What is that impact? A good impact, negative impact, if positive or negative. What exactly does that mean? Don't keep it vague, you know, because people get annoyed. Journal editors will get annoyed with this straight off the bat. Certain impact is just out there in the air make be very clear is it going to increase decrease uh is it going to up regulate down regulate something be very specific all right uh the last sentence so this is the last sentence in the introduction section uh and it's very important that at least your large uh last sentence in the introduction uh was has to restate the aim or your hypothesis because when they start reading the materials and methods they need to know okay fine what exactly are you studying uh if you keep it very general very vague etc that's not going to be very clear so which is why you know i've made this to sound like it's the hypothesis that this is our aim so we think that this could possibly help uh, or reduce the adverse effects etc so uh which is why we are studying this so then when you go to the materials and methods you understand uh why we're doing the study coming to the materials and methods uh as we know numerals should be avoided at the start of the sentence uh there are some journals that do allow it uh and obviously typically if there's any number uh, that's uh below 10 you always generally have to spell it out uh whether it's at the start of the sentence or in the middle of the sentence but avoid doing that now there are many ways you can do it you can either rearrange the letters uh, to say, you know, like so that the number comes in between uh, or say, for example, you can spell out the number. So here, for example, we said four types, etc., as opposed to, you know, just rearranging uh, certain things uh, here. We just rearranged it. Similarly, over here, you go to see we just added like a. Um, this uh, transition subsequently. So we st uh, spoke about transitions, you know, like, however, on the other hand, etc. So we just added this transition that, you know, we did this, then after we did this. So this way, the sentence doesn't start with a number. Uh, very important. And this is something that journals are very particular about. Coming to this, some of you might be like, why uh, is she flagging this? People will say, oh, we did blah, blah, blah at room temperature. The reason why we have materials and methods is also to allow the reader to reproduce the study should they need to. If it's room, if we just give room temperature without the actual degree, uh, it becomes difficult. So I moved this up now from somewhere further down in the document where they said 20 to 25, but I just flagged it because maybe I was mistaken, but basically, you need to define it because your room temperature will vary with geography, with season, and it's not likely to be the same room temperature as, you know, somebody else, somebody else who's reading the paper in another part of the world. It's very important to always define it, right? Right. Now, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so coming to this one. Uh, you'll see that, uh, and this was something that struck me in instantly is because the wording was the same, you know, 80 minutes of testing, 80 minutes experiment. And I was like, wait, what? Uh, you already said 80 minutes here. Why are you saying 80 minutes? And that's when I realized uh, that, oh, wait, <laughs> it's 
repeated. It's repeated information. So you can go ahead, delete it, and you know, combine things together. Uh, avoid repeating the same thing over and over again, because then you're like, it just shows like a lack of diligence, uh, etc. So you just want to be very, very careful. All right. Uh, coming to some second point. So you can see here, I've just spelled that out. Of course, there's another way you can just add another word, etc. So this is not set in stone, but you just shouldn't add this. Uh, right. Uh, coming to this one. Um, so when I was reading this paper, uh, this particular section, I realized this sounded like something that you would have in like the manufacturer manual. Uh, very, uh, it sounded sound very familiar. So I went to look, look it up uh, and I realized that it is from the ma uh, manufacturer instruction manual. If you are, uh, you know, sort of uh, following the protocol that the manufacturer has provided to the letter, like exactly, you don't have to give the exact same details here because, again, the whole point is for reproducibility uh, and, you know, to test that whether your experiment is robust. Uh, so you could just say we... Uh, they perform blah, 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 staining as per manufacturer instruction, and then provide the details of the manufacturer, uh, whether it's Amgen or something of that sort, you know, so that that way then sh should, like, say somebody else want to reproduce the study, they know that they have to get this kit uh, and follow the protocol because the protocol is taken directly from there. Avoid adding so much unnecessary information. Uh, if it's just something that's already readily available. Similarly, if it's from another paper and you've sort of basically uh, adapted the protocol, you can say we follow that protocol, but here are the things that we did change. You don't have to repeat the entire protocol again. Just cite the relevant study, of course, and then talk about how you adapted, what uh, were the changes you made in your protocol. Uh, this also makes your manuscript a lot shorter and a lot easier to read you know, and to understand. And know that your readers are generally subject matter experts, so they're going to know uh, what you're talking about. This is another su subsection in the materials and methods. Uh, now, this is what I was talking about in terms of logical uh, flow. You know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, why are these paragraphs there? My first sentence should tell me why these paragraphs are there and like what is the purpose of the experiment? How is it connected with everything else in the section? You can't just independently have cell processing, cell fixation and not know what is this part of, what is this contributing? And I didn't notice. I wasn't very clear because it was just a little confusing. Uh, so which is why I've said here, it's a little unclear in terms of the goals of the experiment. So are they like general methods for the cytox toxicity tests? Uh, or is it for the flow cytometry or whatever? So then in that case, then you have to move these into those subsections instead of having separate subsections, standalone subsections with no goal mentioned, you know, unless you're actually doing it for something completely different. If they, it's already part of another previous subsection or a subsequent subsection, just combine it there. You know, that makes logical sense that, okay, because I'm doing flow cytometry, I've done X, Y, Z things. Or if it's for something else, I've done X, Y, Z things. But if you just leave it as general as this, like cell processing, cell fixation, I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you making it hard for the reader to understand why you did certain things? That is the main goal as an editor. Think of the reader. Uh, if the reader is going to find it difficult, it could be a journal editor. It could be once your paper is published, the final reader it's going to be difficult if they're going to have to figure out, okay, why have you done something? Um, the materials and methods section, so then have a statistical analysis section. And I was a little confused. It's because there were p-values in the figures and things of that sort. So I know there was some statistical analysis and I honestly cannot believe that uh, a paper of this sort would not have uh, any statistical analysis done. Uh, so, but I found none. And that's also important is that not only to work with what you have, but also to be able to identify, wait, hey, something doesn't add up. Uh, you know, what else? Uh, is there something missing? Uh, and, you know, use cues like have they cited P values in like figures or tables, etc. That means that they've done something. There should be a line on statistical analysis, but there wasn't. Uh, so which is why I feel like this paper missed a very key point. It's possible that they included it in another appendix, et cetera, or something of that sort. But then you have to say that. 
uh, you know, uh, but they've not said it. So again, it's an important alarm bells to uh, go off. Coming to the section that was my least favorite. Um, so it's common to have a combined results and discussion section, uh, but uh, your results will talk about the findings. So you'll have figure citations and things of that sort. Uh, but your discussion cannot be only, okay, you know, our study found this. You need to contextualize the findings. You need to, as I said, what was the aim? Repeat the aim. Make it easier for the reader. It's a long manuscript. Some manuscripts are even longer. Make it easier for the reader to remember, oh, wait, this is my aim. And this was what my main finding. Then start talking about the smaller findings and in greater detail. But you want to remind the reader that. That hasn't happened here. There's no general. Like I would prefer like at least one general paragraph here to talk about this. The answer to the question, uh, basically the aim, and then what is the main answer to the question? Remind the reader. Then afterwards, you can talk about the results and how the results are supported by uh, other studies. Now, one very telltale symbol, uh, uh, not symbol, sorry, indicator that uh, this was not contextualized with other publications, similar publication in the current uh, field was there were no reference citations. There are 32 references uh, in the manuscript, 31 uh, are cited in the introduction, just one is cited after that. And I was like, how is this possible? Like, you know, and uh, and that's just a tip. But you obviously have to read the discussion to figure out if they contextualize it. But that was just like like an alarm bell going off. Like, how do you have all the majority of your references only cited in the introduction? Uh, that means you've not contextualized. And then I started looking at it in more detail and realized, no, they haven't. They've not actually discussed uh, how this bit how the results are supported by other studies, how the results support other studies. How does it differ from these other studies? You know, because the ultimate aim of doing this is to further science and further the research. But if you don't know how this is going to be different from what is already known, and there's so much that is known, and it just becomes difficult to take this study seriously, uh, to be like, okay, this is just like something run of the mill. I don't have to pay attention because I don't know how it's actually furthering research. And that becomes problematic because you might end up publishing or whatever. But if people are not going to read your paper, then it becomes a problem. You know, it's not going to. Now you have different metrics like citation, um, a cit uh, citation index, etc., and stuff like that. So these things need to be taken very, very seriously. So which is why I found that this section was probably the least well done, the results and discussion. Um, some basic issues, uh, tense usage. Uh, very important to remember, whatever was done in this study generally has to be in the past tense because it's not published, it's not accepted fact. Facts can be in the present tense or if you're saying, uh, you know, you can refer, our results are shown in table one or two, whatever. Uh, when you're referring to a table citation or figure citation, you can use the present tense. But when you are using, talking about findings in this current study, because it's not accepted fact, it has to be in the past tense, right? And yes, uh, this is, again, I think we've covered this in another, uh, yeah, so this showed the effect. What effect? Uh, what is this? Be specific. Be clear. Make it easy for the reader to know. Don't force the reader to go back and check, etc. Uh, the next point is about confusing words. Uh, this author used materials and hydrogels interchangeably. Uh, I was a little confused at the first because I was like, okay, wait, what are these materials? And then I had to go back to check, oh, wait, did I miss something? Uh, did they, are they testing materials that are separate from the hydrogels? Or actually, and I realized they were actually talking uh, about the hydrogel. So then my recommendation, just use hydrogel. Why complicate things? Or, you know, make it worse by being abstract about these things. Uh, so yes, so very important, ensure consistency. Don't confuse the readers by introducing variety for your main subject. You can introduce variety in terms of sentence structure, but your main subject, which is your hydrogel, 
maintain consistency in that, all right? And coming almost to the end of uh, this element is uh, that's So this is something for abbreviations. Uh, understand what the abbreviations stand for, all right? The C in HUVAC refers to cells. So if you were to leave this here, it would be cell cells, which is wrong. It's grammatically incorrect. Uh, so see, uh, as I mentioned here, it would be cell cells. It doesn't make sense. So you can just delete this. And if you want to pluralize it, just add the yes. So then it becomes uh, human umbilical vein endothelial cells. All right. So very important uh, when, you know, working with abbreviations, understand what those abbreviations stand for. Um, this is something that a lot of times uh, authors do make this error where, you know, things that are supposed to be in one section are then mentioned in another section. Uh, say, for example, your introduction, sometimes all this literature search that you've done also is repeated again in the discussion. Like, just copy paste it and you're like, bye. I need to understand how your findings are contextualized, not what all the other studies have already done because that's already mentioned, but you have to link it with the findings of these previous studies. Uh, in this case, it's uh, a bit of experimental information that's being mentioned in the results. Again, not required. You often see this also where some experimental, new experimental information is mentioned in the figure legends. Uh, that's problematic because you can't introduce new experiments in the results or in the figure legends because you're like, and a lot of people do that to save space, but it's not uh, acceptable because then you're like, wait, so if I don't look at the figure legends or whatever, I'm just going to lose an entire uh, bit of context uh, regarding your manuscript. So make sure that it's section by section. Um, you know, we have uh, the required information. Uh, this is just a tip, uh, not a must have, but definitely when you're talking about your own results we know that it's you who found it uh you know or you identified something so you don't have to say oh we found that you know you can just be declarative and say that um uh, there are sometimes you know like say in your materials and methods yes you can say you know we conducted blah 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 tests etc rather than saying blah 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 was conducted so you can use the active voice interchangeably there but in your results you don't have to use this as often all right um this is also, I think, an important thing. Uh, so besides ensuring that, you know, you have the right information in the right sections, you also have to make sure that this correspondence, all experiments conducted have to have corresponding results and all corresponding results have to have corresponding experiments. You can't be introducing new information randomly and not have correspondence, all right? Very, very important. Uh, tends to happen to even the best of us, so that's something. So. Uh, what I do is I generally make note of the subheadings in the materials and methods. I write, make a checklist, and then I make a note of the subheadings in the results. doesn't always work, but in most cases it does. Uh, so that way I can check, okay, does everyone have a one-to-one -one correspondence? Or is there something that's suddenly come up? In this case, you would look at, say, the key terms in each section. Uh, are those key terms already present in another part of the manuscript or not? All right, um, and coming to my last point is your conclusions. Like I said, you know, you want your reader to go back with uh, something that's, you know, that stays with you. It's what we call as a take home message. Uh, it's what, you know, this study is all about. But uh, in this case, it was more of like a summary. Yes, it does talk about, you know, it provides new avenues, etc. Again, my problem is, it's a little too general. What are these new avenues with clinical treatment? Uh, you know, what is the possibility? And you can only explain this if you talk about what are the limitations what, uh, of your current study? How is it different from existing studies? Uh, how is it linked? Does it... Uh, correlate is there some justification that you know previous studies have uh, are aligned with etc uh, because that could be otherwise this just is like bluster you know it's like oh I'm just going to put it out there that it has and it, you're not really contextualizing anything and nobody's going to care is the problem uh, 
Uh, so you want to make sure that you contextualize in your discussion and in your conclusion, yes, talk about the aim and talk about your main finding. At the same time, talk about, okay, this study had certain limitations. Uh, what were those limitations? And this is what we can do uh, further, uh, you know, uh, maybe work on eliminating these limitations or maybe apply my findings in a very specific context. Because otherwise, everything is just generic and, like, that's not something that you want to work with. But, yes, uh, that is all that I wanted to talk about. We will be sharing the manuscript, so you can go through my other comments as well. Uh, those are more minute. Uh, so things like, you know, they say absence of light, etc., and stuff like that. So, you know, how can you make that shorter? Uh, things of that sort. So, but yes, that is it from me. I will take questions now if there are any. Um, right. I'm just going to scroll through the chat. Yes, the recording. Um, all right, I'm taking, I take that there are no questions. All right, oh yes, the grammar book, I will, uh, this one second, biomedical, so I will send the links in the chat. Um, sorry, give me one second. Mm. This is the Mimi Zyger book, this is the link. Uh, this is the Oxford Collocations Dictionary that I was talking about. <clears throat> mm. You can use it. You don't have to use it specifically for biomed. You can just use it in general. I use it sometimes in general as well. Uh, and if you want the CSC manual uh, of style, so they, it's a paid uh Thing. So you do have a 30 day free trial period. You also do have access to the Chicago Manual of Style. I would say use the CSC most likely. Uh, you can just go through some of the conventions in that one free month that you have. If you're willing to pay for it, uh, go ahead. Uh, no stop you. But in case you're not in the mood to pay for it, you can just simply use uh, register. And uh, in 30 days, you can just go through it, make notes. Um, I particularly like uh, there are sections on, uh, you know, uh, correct usage of terms, uh, things about also uh, inclusiveness. Uh, so we, I recently, uh, you know, I know we are out of time, so I'll just take one more minute. Um, we recently had a paper where we were talking about certain, uh, you know, uh, sex reassignment uh, surgeries, etc. So it was an, it was a medicine paper, and the title went, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, things were found effective for transgenders. Ah, uh, so I was like, oh my god, you know, we can't let this go out. And unfortunately, the editor missed it. Uh, is because we tend to use it, you know, colloquially and say transgenders, etc. But that's very dehumanizing. I've seen it even in say news. Uh, channels where they use that term and we can't you know you need to make sure that when you're talking about people you're not dehumanizing them you're not invalidating anything even if it's unintentional uh you know so you would say transgender people or transgender patients etc but you don't refer to them as a group transgender so i think the cse uh also the ama i'll include that link so that's paid i don't think they have a uh, free this but you might find it in certain libraries uh so one second me mm. manual of style mm. so if you have if you know someone with access to this it does, definitely does help uh i particularly like the uh, section on inclusive language because it's i know sometimes it's new uh not something that you know we think of right now but it should definitely be a priority moving forward so yeah and particularly if you're working on biomedical manuscripts because you come across that biomedical sociology papers etc very important all right uh i don't think we have any more questions yeah uh so should you have questions later on you can always email me her and yeah we'll send you the manuscript and the record okay thank you everyone and have a lovely rest of the day. All right? Bye.